Joined today by Daniel Principe, an anti-porn activist who spends a lot of time going into schools, a role that sadly, in my opinion, enough people aren't doing. So Daniel, how did you as a man come to find yourself becoming critical of pornography? What motivated you to take this up? Thank you so much, obviously, for the opportunity to speak with you and your and your audience. So for me, my journey, like I'm pretty sure a lot of other men, is I was exposed to pornography when I was 10 years old by an older family friend. And that was when the internet was very different. That was when we had to dial up to it all. But I was exposed. I wasn't looking for it, which validates the statistics that say up to 60% of children are exposed to it by accident. They're not even necessarily looking for it or curiously searching about sex. The internet finds them and porn finds them. And so in my instance, it was an older family friend who introduced it to me. And from then on, from the age of about, yeah, about 10, 11, it was something that was in my life. It was something I couldn't unsee. And it was something that I continued to encounter on people's computers growing up. And so for me, I look at that now and it wasn't until my early 20s when I reflected on it. I didn't like the ideas that had given me. I didn't like how it had contributed to my own ideas about sex, about men, about women, about intimacy and sexuality. And so that was that was the catalyst to go. This thing has in some way, shape or form influenced my ideas on some pretty important topics for the best part of a decade. And it wasn't something that I had had pursued. It's something that found me and then something that I did look at from time to time, probably once a week, twice a week uh, at most. But it was it was a different time back then, but it still shaped my ideas on so many things. Interesting. So you stumbled across it and then after that found it quite difficult to entirely leave it alone. It hooked you. Hasn't it always existed though? I mean, haven't people just stumbled across magazines, for example, in the past? Yeah, yeah. So in terms of the hook thing, I guess you could say that. And there are arguments to be made. Some people reject the concept of sexual addiction to pornography. Some people say, no, that's how it is manifesting. Hence, there's organizations called Fight the New Drug who look at pornography addiction uh, within that framework. For me, I think you don't know what you don't know. I didn't realize how it was harming me. It was, it's obviously what they call in psychology, like a super normal stimulus. Like it's normal to be interested in sex, to be attracted to people, to have sexual desires, but this is feeding them to a young mind in a way that you can't even interpret it or understand it, which leads to your next point about this notion that some people push back and say, oh, but there's always been pornography. And it's a disingenuous argument. The reality is there hasn't always been pornography in terms of what we mean today when we say pornography you know like old school uh you know rock carvings or totems of you know uh phallic symbols is not the same as 4k hardcore graphic video pornography at the click of a button that men uh and some women watch you know up to hours and hours a day everywhere you know so i think when people make that argument i'm like are you willfully you know being that deliberately misleading when people say we've always had pornography uh because yeah i'm sure we can all agree there's a difference between a rock painting uh and 4k graphic pornography that has real people being exploited to to obviously make this content a 10-year-old boy can see more naked women in 10 minutes than the average man was able to in a lifetime throughout the rest of human history. So the idea that somehow what we have now is equivalent to what was existing back then is absurd. Now, yeah, absolutely. You, you mentioned some of the, the harms to people watching porn there in terms of impact on the brain, and we can get into that a bit more later. But what about the people actually making it? What harms are involved to those creating porn? Yeah, it's a good question. I don't know if people listening are familiar with some of the research, some of the literature out there. Uh, there's obviously a lot that looks at, in particular, the women who end up in pornography. And just for the record, I'm probably going to talk about this more in a heteronormative lens. I'm going to talk about this in more heterosexual pornography. I have looked into homosexual pornography in terms of the research in a recent book that I've picked up called Pornography, uh, written by Max Waltman. However, most of my analysis is looking at 
mainstream pornography and how that is harming in particular women and girls who are commodified to produce this content. So in terms of one of the most frightening statistics is the rates of post-traumatic stress disorder for women both in who have been prostituted or in pornography. And Max Waltman has written a book called Pornography, The Politics of Legal Challenges does capture this. And again, the, these research articles are available that these women have higher rates or equal rates of PTSD to those who have returned from wars like Vietnam. And so that for me suggests something completely um, horrific is occurring when we say that this is just like any other job, it, you know, because we do not see those rates except for returned servicemen and women who have obviously seen horrors on the battlefield, both to themselves and, and to others. We've got to look at those sorts of rates, alcohol and drug addiction. We're talking about very vulnerable people who are generally preyed on, who go into these industries, who are exploited into these industries and aren't fully told what will actually occur, what the consequences will be. Both prostituted women and women who have worked in pornography report high rates of onset abuse as well as external abuse that they've received just through being involved in that work. And that's all documented. That's all pretty clear to see. And I think, to be honest, it's pretty self-evident. I mean, most pornography now is outwardly violent. It shouldn't be of any surprise to anyone to recognise that there's both serious harms mentally and physically to these women. And you can get the stories. They're all available of women who have quit the industry, who have reported on what actually happens and the horrors and the abuse. And even mainstream pornographers recently have come out and, 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 and honestly, I can't even repeat it. Uh, some of the things that they themselves tell you that they were subjected to on, on set and how degraded and defiled they felt. But they had to because they were either going to be harmed or withdrawn money or had some other kind of pressure put on them. And so we both see the physical and the mental toll on them. And then the other frightening reality, and I've seen exited uh, former porn performers um, post this online is just how many of these people are no longer with us, either through murder, through suicide or, or other tragic uh, ills that have cut their lives short. And I just think, where, where do you kind of see that kind of fallout from any other job in this world? It, it, there is something very distinct and different about the harms that we see in this particular industry, especially those placed upon women. That was a great overview of the dangers to women involved in porn. But isn't there a feminist case to be made for saying that women choose to be in pornography and it's their right to seek that kind of employment if they want to? Yeah, there's definitely been a vocal push towards that. And the liberal branch of feminism is obviously the strongest advocate for that choice feminism, uh, sex positive feminism, as they like to, to brand it. Uh, and obviously then people who want to watch porn, in particular the men, the Johns who purchase women for sex or, or like to watch porn, love to advance that argument because then obviously it abdicates them of any responsibility to think critically about, well, why are they consuming this material? Why are they okay to participate in a billion-dollar industry that commodifies women and girls and exploits people to keep up with the demand? And so it's such a, it's such a simple kind of wave of the magic wand that therefore means I don't need to think about how I'm participating in something that's extraordinarily corrupt and not only harmful to myself, but harmful to society as a whole. But they make this argument because they obviously look at this individual woman and what they'll try to do is I always try and highlight the cases of wealthy white women who have kind of made it either on OnlyFans or through pornography and try to make, you know, this kind of exception that proves the rule argument that this is a lucrative career when in actual fact, most people don't make money from this. Most people are exploited to this. And we have people like Mia Khalifa who have left the industry telling you that she made no money from this. She came out of it with absolutely nothing. And we see that time and time again. We see that with OnlyFans. They want to highlight the success stories, but the average person on OnlyFans makes the $180 a month, but they're spending hours and hours producing content that they'll never get back that's there now available for, for the web. And so we look at this and we go, well, they're not, again, telling the truth of the matter. They're not, again, telling the reality of what actually goes on. And again, back to the choice. As I highlighted earlier when it comes to, well, if we look at the histories of a lot of the women that end up in these industries, 
is not so much about a matter of choice, it's the fact that they had no other choices, no other options. And, and another frightening statistic about a lot of these women is just like the, the horrific rates of childhood sexual abuse. And some of the studies have shown up to 50, 60% of women in, in prostitution and pornography have had some sort of experience of childhood sexual abuse and childhood violence. And so we're looking at that and 50% of them who this was a, a, an option, otherwise it was, you know, being on, on the dole or not having any other means to actually earn any money. And so again, what kind of material choices are we looking at here? And if we don't recognize the extraordinary vulnerabilities across a whole host of different issues, and for the people who are so concerned with justice on that side, who want to, you know, flaunt their liberal credentials, it's a real blind spot on that progressive wing of politics. I think it's quite shocking for me that this is people who would talk about things like capitalism, like patriarchy, like racism, and for me, it's like, if you want to see the worst example in human history of that, then look to the global porn industry. This is an industry that chews up and spits out women, that exploits women, and in particular, marginalized women from minority communities. So in the US, it's Native American women and African American women are some of the most marginalized and proportionately represented in both prostitution and, and pornography. And in Europe, it's Eastern European migrant women or, or African women who have, who have migrated, who again, are most likely to be exploited because of that lack of choice, because not only are there barriers uh, in terms of financially, there, there are in terms of other forms of participation that all people from minority backgrounds experience when they when they come to places like the US or, or Europe. And so for me, I've always been astounded that the analysis seems to stop. And I hope you don't mind me saying this when erections or male arousal or money to be profited off of women's bodies seems to enter the frame. And so I find it just absolutely astounding how we haven't seen uh, the mass push of cancel culture to an industry that, you know, like if you were to look at some of the porn titles on some of the major uh, porn websites, this is stuff that anywhere else in society would be met with so much outrage and condemnation. But because it's kind of in the, in the banner of sexual desire, it's like it gets a free pass. And for me, I just cannot understand that. I, I cannot understand the cognitive dissonance that goes on, that it's like that's inappropriate to say, but if you're at home masturbating to that, then that's all okay. People need to think hard about that contradiction. I'm not sure that it can be explained away. I think it's a blind sight, as you suggest. And ultimately, most of the time, what these men are masturbating over is a trafficked drug addict many times that's the reality of it and yep. that means that the question of the possibility of ethical porn i mean i've heard ethical porn recommended in schools to students is a very fraught what one horror. do you think there can be such a thing as ethical porn it's it's good you may have to slow me down on this one but let's let's take it from the top I've tried to engage as much as I can with both academic literature as well as news articles who suggest something along the lines of ethical porn. Now, first of all, no one can define it. No one can tell me what it is and what it's not. And to create actual robust categories that we can confirm or deny constitutes something of ethics when it comes to pornography. Now, that's if we grant them the notion that this thing even exists. Then the second question is, could we even produce it under the current condition, something that constitutes ethical? And so let's get to the reality, which is the porn industry, again, is a billion dollar industry that is connected and completely tied to pimping and trafficking of women and girls. These major tube stations have had to strip down millions and millions of videos that were either underage, non-consensual, trafficking, all these kinds of horrors. Tens of millions were actually stripped down because they couldn't be verified. So again, let's actually deal with reality of what is going on. And then another, another topic that we need to touch on, I'm just planting those two other categories, but another topic is the reality of, is that even what people are interested in? Is that what people are looking into? You know, and it's not. And the reality is, no, they're not. 
the most popular porn are usually the most degrading, the most violent. So again, for me, it's becomes a mute point. And especially when you understand how the brain works with regards to desensitization, which is that the initial kind of, if you want to say, uh, more mainstream vanilla, to use their kind of words, pornography, uh, of one man, one woman, missionary sex isn't going to do it for you anymore. That might not actually get you titillated enough. So you have to look for more and more extreme content over time, which is exactly what desensitization is. It's exactly what happens in our, in our limbic system. And it's where the term limbic capitalism comes from, which we see with both gambling or online gaming, uh, is this notion that you need a new and more novel hits of stimulation to get that same high. And that comes back to why some people recognize this as manifesting in drug-like ways because of how people need more and more extreme content to get that same stimulation. So again, even if it could exist, you can't get away from the fact that it operates in an ecosystem of abuse, of its discrimination, of racism, and continues to fund and funnel money to some of the most exploitive humans in the world and corporations in the world. In Eastern Europe, they have warehouses of women who are exploited to just make pornography. And the owners of these companies know that. That's why they're being investigated because they went there and said, great, we don't care. We just know we can't get that content here, but we'll purchase it from you because we know we can make lots of money on that for clicks. So again, that's the ecosystem. The challenge is even if you could create this ethical porn, it would still escalate to more abhorrent things anyways, because that's what brains do. That's what people seek. So again, from those two factors, it's just, it's a ridiculous enterprise. But let's take it back to this notion of if we could define it, if we could actually create ethical porn, and I've engaged with some of these people that want to be the PR kind of spin uh, of the porn industry by saying ethical porn, which we know is just spin and propaganda to not look at the absolute horrors that go on. And they just kind of want to wave this little thing like, look over here, ethical porn, which, which is just ridiculous. But for example, I've got one recently from this week that I just found on a website. It said, here's four things to look for to make sure your porn is ethical. You see these on Instagram all the time. The first one said that the, that the performers are over 18. It's like, well, great. What a baseline. What, they're not children? They're not minors being exploited? Like, like, that's a good thing. Like, pat yourself on the back. You're not involved in child sexual abuse material. And again, so what that someone's an adult? That doesn't necessarily mean something's ethical. Like, what a low standard. So, okay, that was the first thing they proposed. What an absolutely useless point. We'll drop down to the next one, that people are being paid fairly. Again, okay, well, tell me, what is fair pay to exploit and commodify humans with content that exists on the internet for life? What, what's a fair proportionate pay? And secondly, if you came up with that figure, no one sitting at home masturbating knows whether that person's been paid. We have no idea what goes on. We have no idea what kind of transactional arrangements have occurred, whether this person's had a gun held to their head, whether they've been told that they can't receive payment until they agree to X, Y, Z, which you can see in the exit interviews. There's famous pornographers who have been involved where they've literally been told, unless you say that everything was okay, we're not paying you and you won't get future work. So again, what kind of conditions are these people saying, yes, I've been paid, I've been remunerated for this work? And again, just utterly, utterly absurd. And then they'll say things like, a diversity of bodies and colors of people. And it's like, again, what does that matter? You could actually use that as an argument to say, well, yeah, they're, they're fetishizing minorities, which is what pornography does. Pornography is, as I've already touched on, is where you see the most stereotypical racist depictions of all sorts of minorities. And we see even people with disabilities being exploited in pornography. Anything that can be a marginalized minority gets exploited in pornography, but they put forward these ideas as if it's some sort of legitimizing ethical framework. And, and the list goes on. And, and for me, they're all just utterly obscene. They say things like consent. Again, how do you know this person's consented and to what? You weren't in the room. You can't confirm that. No one can ever prove that consent has occurred through the mediation of a screen. And so it's all an illusion to appease the conscious of the person who, as you've already said, is sitting at home masturbating usually to drugged up women being exploited and abused. Yeah. With no other choices in life. 
And so, yeah, this is just what people we, who now live in this, you know, post-liberal society, they want to appease their conscience and their sensibilities that what they're actually doing um, is okay. And the reality is it's not. And instead of trying to find lots of loopholes and justifications for what they're doing, how about we take a radical analysis and look at this industry for what it is and confront it for the reality, which is the reality that is, I have contributed to this because I have looked at pornography and in doing so, uh, drove clicks, therefore profits, therefore driven, you know, uh, this industry. And that's hard to sit with, but we all need to sit with that. We all need to recognize that in some ways we have contributed to this industry that, that exploits humans for profit. And so that for me is the challenge and the task before all people of goodwill, not to try and find these little ethical distractions uh, and loopholes to try and justify our behavior. And so, yeah, they're just a few of them, but there's so many more. And it doesn't take one, you know, much scratching below the surface to realise how flimsy that this is. It's a complete house of cards that they're trying to build to distract from, like I said, the realities and the horrors. That was such a good answer. You can really see your passion coming through there. And one thing I want to draw people's attention to in what you said is that by its nature, porn tends towards its most extreme manifestations because it works like an addiction. So people need a greater and greater dose each time because they become desensitized. So there's a sense in which you may as well talk about ethical heroin. Once people are hooked on it, then it's only going one way. So the question is, is it ethical even to begin to begin right. taking it? And That's right. what you've just said there should give people real pause for thought. Now, it's sad that so many young people, I've already mentioned hearing ethical porn recommended in schools, so many young people are being encouraged to engage in this. Many of them feel that it is already changing the dating landscape. This is something I quite often get asked, in particular from, from younger women trying to negotiate what I call porn culture. You know, we're living in a sex saturated world where everyone has cheapened the meaning and the value of sex. And irrespective of your beliefs, there's something that is significant about the sexual act, because unlike any other, it can actually produce children, uh, which is just a biological reality. As I've said to young people, that shouldn't shock or horror anyone. This is like basic human bio class. And so there's something pretty significant and distinct that happens. And, and science has taught us more and more that there's bonding that goes on with different neurochemicals that are released in our brains when we have sex. And so there, this is uh, meaningful, whether people bring to it uh, meaning from, from any other belief systems or worldviews they have, the sexual act is not a small thing, but we've tried to tell ourselves it is, and then try to suppress the... Uh, all the consequences that have arisen in society from treating it as such. And so that's what we're now dealing with, is we want to regard it as meaningless and then wondering why there's so much pain and trauma when this goes wrong. And that's the kind of, uh, again, cognitive dissonance that we're now faced with as a society that wants to say, go and pretty much do whatever you like as long as it's consensual. And again, consent isn't enough to deal with the challenges that we're faced with and in porn culture where so many young women in particular are groomed through the culture around them to accept horrific behavior from young men. And young men as well are groomed by pornography to act out this kind of behavior where we're seeing more and more violence, more and more degrading both speech and acts entering into people's bedrooms and shock horror I wonder where they're learning that from and especially when we see the rise in the hundreds of percentiles of child on child sexual abuse where can that only be coming from and it's no surprises that exposure to pornography is becoming younger and younger which again sorry to derail back to the question so we're existing in this culture women are very aware of it because for them it's like what do I need to do to choose a good partner? And I have a zero tolerance approach, which is I wouldn't date and let alone marry someone who is a, you know, a, a porn user who has no plans to stop that because of a few things that, again, the global research is clear on. 
People that are more like who use pornography regularly at consumer are more likely to believe rape myths. They're more likely to be desensitized to violence and sexual violence in particular. And they're more likely to actually perpetrate and try and be coercive in their sexual behavior. And so for those reasons alone, those people should be avoided especially if you're a young woman not looking to be traumatized in a relationship or during some sort of sexual experience with this particular person. And so you can see that in Australia, we have the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare. They have that in a government report. We see this in more and more in the literature coming through. I have a colleague here in Australia who's done his PhD and, and his findings on this particular is both the combination of pornography and social media is driving higher rates of narcissism and lower capacities for empathy. And again, I'm not sure about you or the listeners, but for me, I definitely don't want to be dating a narcissist. And I certainly don't want to be dating someone who has a decreased capacity for empathy. And this is something that young people are having to negotiate. And they're having to negotiate that young men have just completely got their sexual template and their sexual scripts is what the research calls it is a sexual script from pornography that is heavy on violence, low on consent, because porn obviously teaches young people that women are available for sex anywhere, anyhow, anytime. And you don't have to consider her preferences, her pleasure, her dignity, her worth, her yes, her no's, just go for it because she's keen. And even if she says no, you could probably just pressure her around to it. So again, this is why I caution young women, in particular in relationships, and for young men, again, to think well about the type of women they want to be with, because I wouldn't date a woman that looks at pornography either. I wouldn't want someone bringing that kind of template and any other things that they've learned from pornography into my relationship, let alone into the bedroom. Yeah, the, the other point to bring up here is that men who watch porn actually find real life women less attractive sexually often to the point of impotence and it works the other way around as well women find men who watch porn less attractive so you're breaking down the basis of a good relationship in terms of mutual attraction and chemistry even on that level that's right. That's right. There, people have tried to argue that porn can kind of spice up your sex life. But again, the research that I've engaged with and, and my friend Marshall Ballantyne Jones, his PhD speaks to this and it says couples that both watch pornography had reported the least, um, what do you call it, fulfilling sex life. And people, both couple, when both partners didn't watch pornography, it was the most fulfilling. Because obviously what we find, and I've heard like feminists talk about this, women who watch pornography are so influenced because their partner's showing it. In, in, in sex, they become so conscious about what do I look like? Do I look like this porn star? How do I look? So she's too busy worrying about how she looks, not is she enjoying this? Is she present? Is she connected? And the guy as well is thinking, am I able to replicate this scenario that I saw on the internet last night. And so again, we don't really have people actually having sex. What I call it and what others have called it is they're just masturbating with one another's bodies. That's a very profound way of putting it. And there's something there about thinking only of your own pleasure and being focused very much on image i think that captures what is happening rather than it being a self-giving act where you're interested in this other person's pleasure and preferencing them and ensuring that they feel safe that they feel like they are enjoying themselves during this and so what we actually see is pornography creating horrible lovers and and i hear this i I usually get one to two stories a week from women and, and even more recently from gay men telling me that They've gone from having an experience and they could tell the difference between someone who wasn't indoctrinated by porn and someone who is. And the complete different experience of of engaging in sexual activity with people who you can just tell have porn brain. The the marketing is so powerful, though, as you'd expect from a billion dollar industry, that some men have been duped into believing there's something manly about watching porn. It's what real men do, like drinking beer or playing football. I mean, ironically, tragically, it can lead to the very opposite impotence, which is what most people would say is the biggest (laughs) way of feeling assaulted as a man. So what can we do to help more young men resist porn? 
Yeah, I agree. And it's an interesting distinction. And I, I had a recent interview guest who highlighted that as well, that he was saying, you know, 20, 30 years ago, watching pornography was seen as you're the weirdo, you're the creep, you're kind of a strange bit of a pervert, whereas that's really shifted in popular culture. But I think we are seeing a shift again. We're not there. I think it's punk rock now to be anti-porn because it's so mainstream. Like when people try to be edgy with porn, I'm like, yawn, that's so boring. It's done to death. Like porn is saturated everywhere. That's no longer, like it's no longer edgy. It is It is far more punk rock to actually resist it. And I I'm hoping that that happens in the generation to come after me who are starting to resist in greater numbers recognize that. And so, yeah, it is because like, let's be honest, like virility is seen as like something so connected to manliness and manhood. And for me, it's like, you know, the porn induced erectile dysfunction, which we're now seeing in adolescent men for the first time in human history uh, is certainly a catalyst, I know, for a lot of young boys to quit pornography. I don't think it's the ultimate reason. The ultimate reason is because you respect the inherent dignity of other humans, in particular women involved in this industry, so that you can no longer be aroused uh, by their exploitation and degradation. However, if someone's penis no longer working is the first catalyst that starts a conversation, which again, people don't believe me, go on to Reddit, go on to these forums, go on to YouTube videos under Russell Brand. You see dozens and dozens, if not hundreds of men speaking out, affirming the fact that, yeah, this was causing them to not be able to enjoy sex and they had to reboot, they had to quit. They, they recognized that porn was impacting their ability to enjoy sex. And one of the research papers that my colleague Melinda Tankard Reese and I highlight is this paper where it was a small case study of a few dozen young men between the age of about 13 to 30 who were compulsive porn users. We're talking anywhere between one to get this seven hours of porn use a day. And they'd all experience porn-induced erectile dysfunction. They'd all experience a rewiring of the brain, which they would become aroused when they saw their keyboard, when they saw their mouse, when they saw their phone, like that's what would get them aroused, not skin on skin contact, not the presence of a real woman, which for any psychology students out there, they recognize that's the same phenomenon as Pavlov's dog, who were trained to not respond to food and salivate, but actually to the ring of the bell. And it's the same phenomenon at, at, at play here, where people are then trained, the keyboard or the mouse or the phone tells their brain arousal or something stimulating is happening and they're not able to get uh, aroused to the presence of a real human. So tragic, so sad. The hope in it, though, is what science has now taught us over the last 10 to 20 years in particular about neuroplasticity. So yes, we can rewire our brains. And these are clunky terms to talk about what's happening at a, at a very you know, uh, minute chemical level in the brain uh, with neurotransmitters between neurons. But in essence, we're now being able to rewire the brain away from that by being able to step away from that stimulation and condition our minds to respond to other stimulation. So that's the beauty of neuroplasticity, but of course it requires something to, to do that. Yeah, and for people listening, feeling like they've hit a dead end with their own personal engagement with the evils of porn, listen to what Daniel's saying about neuroplasticity because there is hope. You can change, you can rewire. Many people have done it and you can as well. And that idea of a dead end now, is affecting so many young people that some need quite basic relationship advice about how to have a healthy relationship. What would you suggest to people trying to help young people form healthy relationships with each other? Yeah, it's huge. And it's one of the goals that I have whenever I work with a school, in particular, if it's obviously co-ed or if it's a single sex school looking to engage well with their brother or sister school is how do we actually humanize one another in their minds? And in particular for young people where everything is mediated through screens, it's like, what does it actually look like to form connection and see the full humanity of another person? And to be honest, that's the task before all of us. How do we facilitate for young people to recognize the dignity of one another? to recognize the humanity of one another. And I don't have simple solutions for that. I think that's a huge task of not only parents, but educators, community groups, because it's actually one of the biggest 
uh, points of feedback we get from young people that we unpack is they say, we have no idea how to be in a healthy relationship anymore. And it's not only pornography, it's Hollywood. It's the poison of pop culture and Hollywood and, and all the terrible ideas that are presented to them is it's like, what does it actually look like? And so this is going to be a huge task going forward in, in, in this current cultural moment that we're facing where everything is you know, disposable, where we ghost one another, use one another. And so I'm hoping for young men that they'll aspire to such a healthier version of manhood and masculinity where they actually want to carry themselves in such a way that they don't want to become the type of men that porn culture says you are. And the reality is, that, like, what does porn culture or pop culture say about men? It says that they're practically Neanderthals who, are, who, are, who cannot control their desires, their arousal, and they're just groomed by money, sex, and beer that they, they have no capacity for self-control and self-restraint. And I just completely re reject that. I completely reject that because I get to work with incredible men every single day all across Australia who are embodying something so much more fulfilling and meaningful and, in my mind, so much more attractive for the world around them. And so for me, it's like critiquing that and encouraging that. And the same for young women is it's like what kind of... Uh, you know, womanhood do you want to embody? And I'm not going to sit here and prescribe that for them. But I think for them, it's like, can we critique what's being offered for you and what you're actually being validated for, which is usually just revealing more and more of yourself, sexualizing yourself more and more and conforming to porn culture and misogynistic male gaze and being applauded for that. And again, I'm not sure how empowering that is. And that's not popular because, again, if you've been duped into believing that and conforming to the most sexist stereotypes to get validation, it's hard to wean yourself off that Kool-Aid uh, and find other ways to act and be in the world. But the whole exercise I usually run in, in with, with the young women in schools, it's like, how do we actually value you for things other than how you look and your sexual desirability to men in particular? And what does it look like to champion and celebrate that? And again, and for the boys in schools to recognize that and to see women succeeding and flourishing and being valued for things outside of their sexual desirability and conforming to the boys' wishes. And so that's a huge task before all of us. I had a teacher approach me yesterday saying, you know, like, how do we actually help young women be strong to have boundaries to resist this kind of messaging? And again, it's the task before all of us. And again, the task for young boys as well to not be those kinds of guys, which is what I challenge them. Because in my mind, it is a miracle if a young woman can get through this culture and get to her early 20s, having not developed some sort of mental illness, uh, eating disorder, sexual harassment, sexual assault because of the culture that she's having to negotiate. And I challenge young men, like, are you going to contribute to that? Are you going to be another hurdle, another creep, another thing that she has to try and negotiate as she's just trying to go about her everyday life to try and thrive and flourish in this world? It's strange, isn't it, to think that after so many decades of probably the most aggressive sex education programs for children in human history, We've got children saying they don't know how to have healthy relationships. It's almost as if the aim of the sex ed wasn't really about healthy relationships at all. Yeah, you have to wonder. But again, it's like you look at there's so many factors that have led us here. And it's the same here in Australia because there's been all this push for consent. We need to do more with regards to consent education. Meanwhile, no one wants to speak to the problem of pornography. And it's like, where do you think this problem is arising from and of course there's always been sexual assault and 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 harassment before mainstream pornography as we have it now but this is just supercharged and conditioning young minds in particular to act this stuff out and so again it's like we want young men to respect women we want young men to ask for consent and to engage in sexual relations with healthy ideas meanwhile we've given them global porn since the age of eight, nine years of age and hoping that that's going to help them have the right idea about women and sex. Like the absurdity of that, you know, if, if, I, if I don't laugh, I just cry because of how absurd it actually is. And that we're trying to hope, hope that somehow these young men won't be groomed by the time they become adults to completely just view women as sex objects who exist for men's pleasure. Like good luck, good luck. People would say in response to you, though, that 
porn helps children explore their sexuality and that's a healthy thing it can help them develop healthy relationships what would you say back what sexuality are they exploring you know uh, sexuality prescribed to them again by a billion dollar industry that exploits humans and i'm talking irrespective of your sexuality and irrespective of who you're attracted to or, or how you engage sexually like is that really again where you want to learn your templates and your scripts from and in my mind it is actually distorting sexuality it's giving people the wrong ideas about sex again being curious and wanting to learn about sex is very normal, but we have managed that for most of human history as a sexually reproducing species. Uh, we've clearly managed to work out how the parts uh, fit. And again, I'm all for the fact that there has been a shift to recognize that it's not sexuality, it's not just about men's preferences and men's desires, and that there has been a shift in that, that it's not just uh, orientated to, to men's wants. However, I'm not sure that this industry that is completely created by men for men uh, and is completely patriarchal in its depictions is going to help us learn about mutual sexuality and what it is that's beneficial, given that as Fight the New Drug usually uh, tweets every so often, it's hard to learn about sex from an industry that profits off of fake orgasms. Mm, yeah, nice way of putting it. Um, my response would be that, yeah, that's right. They, they do explore sexuality, including sex with animals, corpses, children. That's right. Exactly. And all sorts of other absurd things that we would rightfully call paraphilias. And we've lost that language. I've learned that from Jermaine Greer, thanks to her and her incredible work, is we, we now live in an age where it's like, we, we can't actually rightfully recognize that these are disordered desires or paraphilias and that the porn industry is just trying to provoke more and more. Because if you provoke more and more desires, and I would say perversions out of someone, then you're, you've got more of a product for this person to continue to come back for. So if you continue to provoke a new desire for some other perversion, some other paraphilia, this person like a slave continues to come back on the altar of, of this to, to spend their money and spend their time. Yeah. I mean, that's what it is. Ultimately, it's a recognition that some things are disordered and it's a return to virtue. It's about people having self-control and recognizing that there are better ways to live. And I guess Absolutely. you must have seen some stories to motivate you, things that keep you coming back. What are some of the most powerful experiences that you've had in schools? Yeah, it's great. I'd, I'd love to touch on your virtue because that is something that I'm passionate about and something that I actually espouse as part of the work I do. And in terms of self-control, I mean, look no further than what these porn sites do during No Nut November, which is obviously all about men trying to resist the urge to just be enslaved to their desires to watch porn and masturbate. They try and throw promotions out there. They taunt men to kind of succumb and look at porn, which again comes back to my point. How does this industry view men? Well, completely as losers who have no self-control, who have no virtue, who can do nothing but succumb to their most base instincts and act it out. That's how the porn industry relates to men. And it's like, if that's how you want to be related to, like, that's pretty sad, but that's certainly not how myself and the other men that I associate with regard ourselves as men. So I just thought it was worth touching on that. But in terms of the stories that give me hope, like I am just, so fortunate that in every school and in every audience I get to engage with, we just have young people say, and this is where the hope is, we've never heard someone offer a critical analysis of pornography. We've never heard that there was an alternative. We've never, like, th this is how sad it is, though. Like, we have to deal with how sad it is. But then the hope is, we have young women saying, we never knew we could say no. And so the hope is, we have a whole generation of young people who we can equip to, to actually deal critically with this culture and with pornography itself and to strengthen them and give them resolve. But at the same time, we are working from like absolute like bottom of the barrel when you have young women not realizing that they could say no to this. And so the hope is like, we have a blank slate to try and do good here because these young people have never heard anything Then porn is great. And I, usually, I always ask them, it's part of my feedback. Have you heard this before? And they all say no. Because, of course, all they've been told is porn is great, porn is awesome, watch porn, there's no consequences. And then you do a 30-minute presentation with them showing what the global research 
shows and then telling them all the anecdotal stories that you've heard about the harms to men, women and society and uh, the creators of pornography. And it's like, well, hang on a minute. And it's like, yeah, kids, there's some serious propaganda at hand here where they don't want you to realize that this is an ill. And again, they prey on you. None of you should be exposed to this content, but they are preying on you because they want consumers. They want you locked in and addicted before your brains have had a chance to fully grow. And if that doesn't make you enraged, and if that doesn't upset you, then I, I, I don't know what more to say. It was like when Billie Eilish came out last week and said that she started using at 11. And you have the pro-porn apologists want to say, well, what were her parents doing? Or they just dismiss it altogether because they cannot stop to consider for a moment they are promoting an industry that literally preys on children and wants them hooked to this and distorts their ideas. And so stories like Billy's give me hope. Here we have one of the most high profile women in the world telling other young people, this stuff is bad. And the reality is the science is clear on it. The stories are clear. Every week, my colleagues and I hear the harms. It's just a matter of telling them. And people know this sitting at home, whether it's the guy struggling, whether it's the woman with a partner who's hooked, or whether it's someone trying to work out what's right for them, please don't be gaslit by a billion dollar industry that has no regard for your well-being. It wants to exploit you, it wants you to be a consumer, and it also probably would have you become one of its performers and content creators if it could profit from you as well. So don't take sex advice, don't listen to this industry and wake up to the exploitation going on. And and don't conform to it. Now, that's easier said than done, but that's the crosswords that we're at as a society and as a civilization. Because if porn continues to triumph, as Robert Jensen says, it is what the end of the world looks like. There's a reason that students aren't being presented with both sides of this debate. And that's because 30 minutes from you is more powerful than five years of the other side of the debate. So the more this message can get out there, the better, because it has the power to change people's lives. Why do you think it is that people like you aren't being heard more? Why is there so little promotion of the anti-porn message, especially in schools? That's very kind of you to say that. I'd love to think and hope that this message does impact people and you know, we just hope and trust that it does and plant seeds because I know that not everybody's ready to turn away straight away and they have to go on their own journey and get their own reason why. Well, the, the, the obvious answer is it's a billion dollar industry with vested interests. And unlike so many other justice issues, and I, and I talk about this in, in my own um, circles that I confide in, is there's so many other issues out there that, that I think are legitimate causes, you know, whether we want to tackle things like whether it's climate change or wealth inequality or racism or corruption in the banking sector or, or where, wherever that we find injustice in this world. A lot of these causes are championed by people who like to create the evil and the enemy out there, whether it's this evil business, this evil corporation, this evil politician, this evil billionaire. That is a really easy message to sell because it's all about othering and making other people the bad guys. Whereas if you want to join us in this message, it actually starts with serious self-examination because I myself am still negotiating porn culture. I'm still negotiating the fact that I live in a hyper-sexualized world saturated with pornography and I have contributed to that and I have benefited from that in, in a sense because of how it's depicted women and, and how that's allowed me to act in the past before I quit porn over a decade ago. And so if we're going to engage in this issue and if we're going to do it with integrity, we have to start with our own hearts and our own minds. And not everybody wants that kind of justice. They want the issue where it's all about yelling at how bad other people are. Whereas if you want to join us in this, it looks like recognizing yourself as participating in these systems, then, then sorting yourself out, exploring your own soul, your own darkness, your own reasons that have led you to pornography, how it's harmed you, how it's harmed your relationships, not just sexual, but all relationships. Because as I say to girls, do you know those creeper vibes? Yeah, people feel those creeper vibes on guys. And so that's why this issue is hard, because it really does start with examining ourselves 
and taking steps from there outward before we want to go and reorder all of society. And as much as I want to, porn should be banned, period. And I know people will push back on that and say underground. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, we'll deal with the consequences of that. Right now, the consequences of porn are far more frightening than anything else than we could imagine as a society. And so that's why this issue doesn't get dealt with. And too many people profit from it. You know, and we see a new era of sexologists and sex therapists who are pretty much shills for the industry. And what I find so ironic is if you actually look at the issues that these people treat and you go to their website and you see what you can come and see them for in terms of, you know, relationship problems, erectile dysfunction, arousal issues, you know, struggling with intimacy. In the, they, they put a list and you could literally put harms of pornography and the global research right next to all of them. And again, why would you want to kill your business model? So instead of actually dealing with the problem of porn, they, they sell porn or they promote things from the sex industry uh, as why you're having issues rather than the thing itself. And, and lastly, of course, we have to look at the reality that this causes a great deal of shame for people. It's really hard for some people to talk about it. Um, I've had to overcome that because I sh I've shared my story to tens of thousands of people so far here in Australia. So at the end of the day, I'm pretty open about it and we need more courageous men to come out and speak to the harms of this and actually speak to how this has impacted them and disordered them and their lives and their relationships. And so I recognize that that's tough, but it's so worth it when you're on the other side. And we haven't painted a good enough picture on what it's like to actually be porn free and what it's like to have that brain fog lift, to not be viewing women through the lens of pornography every moment of every day, which is a lot of what the recovering users tell me was where they were at, where every woman for them was just put into a porn script. And so I would say to people, it is so worth it to quit pornography for, for what that actually leads you to in terms of your quality of life, in terms of how you relate to yourself, respect yourself, and also respect for others. On that point about the way it changes how you view people, one of the most terrifying things in the research is how fathers see their daughters. That, for some men, is the wake up. Their daughters and their daughters' friends starting to appear in new ways because of their porn addiction. And what you said about virtue and people having to look inside is important as well. It's a bit like the legend about vampires where they're at the door, but you have to let them in. Otherwise, they can't gain entry. So people have to think, how come I open that door? What was it that let porn into my life? I think you're right. It's easy to externalize it and place the blame elsewhere. But a bit of soul searching there is going to be important but also some sympathy for yourself and some compassion because sex after all is one of the most powerful human motivators That's and right. people with motives beyond just profit have weaponized it to create all kinds of social devastation. Right. Roger Scruton called porn a social disease. And there are people yes. who want sick society because it means that they can rework it according to some different model. So it's deliberately being used in a destructive way. Absolutely. And I, I'm with you on that. And I do, I do want to state that again, I, if it hasn't come through already, that I do feel for young men and young women in particular, because as I said, this industry preys on them. So it's not about you being bad because you've stumbled across porn and developed a consumption towards it, but it is recognizing the harms that this causes. Yes, you've been preyed on, but then we all have to make a decision and you have to come to that. What is your reason why you're going to quit? Because, yeah, this industry has, has preyed on you. And so that's why I never hammer young men. They think I'm going to, but I actually really sympathize with them because I think they have the hardest task out of any generation to cultivate virtue in a time where they're awash with sexuality and sexualization everywhere they look. To have the self-restraint they need to get through a day is far more than, than people 40, 50 years ago. Yep. Biologically, men do have higher sex drives than women, and especially teenage boys flooded with testosterone have got the hardest job trying to engage yeah. with this. Now, that's right. what advice would you give to your younger self? Yeah, I wish I, I knew that I could have spoken to an adult and told them what I'd seen. Yeah, I wish I could have spoken to someone about it and 
and talked it through and understood what I was looking at and the harms of it and being able to have a safe place because obviously it was something that I just consumed, you know, irregularly, but for 10 years. And so I wish I'd known that. I wish I'd been told and had other ways of seeing sex. So not just about not looking at what was bad, but actually having a vision for sexuality and relationships. And most importantly, for the man I wanted to be, that was something worth aspiring to. And because it's not just about quitting porn, it's like, what are you filling your life with? What are the things that give you purpose and meaning? What are the habits and goals that you're working towards in terms of the man you want to be? And that's the biggest problem is we live in an age with too much leisure time and not enough meaning. And so young men are filling it with all sorts of things that are not beneficial for them. And so I wish I'd known that, but I'm grateful to have learned what I learned in my early 20s and to have come across this message, to have learned about human trafficking for the first time and and the horrific world that is out there of exploiters harming women and girls. That's a really powerful point to finish on. Where can people find out more about you and your work? Sure. Well, obviously, get in touch via Instagram. They can look into the interview series I've just released called Reimagining Masculinity, Conversations with Men Challenging Porn Culture. So I've had some incredible guests on there who are working in this space in different ways, from a psychotherapist who deals with sex addiction to Professor Robert Jensen, who's an incredible scholar, to a recovering porn consumer, uh, to other men involved in this space with more to come. So you can check that out on YouTube and look into the organization that I'm so fortunate to partner with here in Australia called Collective Shout, whose whole mission is for a world free of sexploitation. So confronting both pornography and porn culture here and across the world and, and people who objectify women and sexualize young girls to sell products. So please check us out, get involved and get in touch and always happy for people to slide in my DMs, ask questions. I I, I always appreciate people who want to engage in good faith and encourage one another on this path Um, because there are no superheroes. I'm not one. I'm just people. I'm just someone who's been so fortunate to meet a lot of good men and women who have helped me on my journey and read some good books that have helped me think well, hopefully about these issues and, and make better decisions for me. So that offer is always there. And, and I'm just so grateful for this opportunity to chat with you, Will. You're welcome. I think this is going to be a very helpful interview for people. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Daniel. No worries. Thank you so much. Cheers.